60 years later, even tech-savvy parents still aren't ready to hire robo-nannies for their children. Dr. Maya Matarik wants to change that. Our robots are safe, they're friendly, they're cute, they're fun, and they're helpful. There's so many people who could use something, someone, to help them on a daily basis. Dr. Matarik's students are developing a new generation of socially assistive robots, machines that can help humans in every aspect of their lives. PR2 uh, actually was designed as a robot platform for mobile manipulation. It would go around and pick up objects and uh, move them around in the environment. Uh, we're trying to show that you could use this kind of robot platform not just for mobile manipulation, but also for this socially assistive robotics context. To achieve this, the students are tapping into PR2's state-of-the-art integrated functions. We have stereo cameras up here for wide field of view and narrow field of view. Gives us a 5.1 megapixel uh, picture of the environment. It has these two really complex manipulators on uh, both sides of its body, sort of like a human has uh, with their arms. And uh, we have these really nice grippers on the end here that can grab objects with different kinds of force. And I can actually see the objects with the cameras here, so it's actually aware of what it's doing. It combines that information with the camera information from the head to really understand what's going on in the environment. PR2's cameras and manipulators make it a natural for executing complex spatial tasks like household chores. But multiple infrared laser scanners give PR2 the ability to see beyond the tasks at hand. On the ground here, we have this ground-based laser. It scans in a plane and gives us really, really accurate distance readings uh, down to a few millimeters. So it could actually move around the same way that you or I would. We have a sensor up here. It's tilting up and down, so it gives us this nice scan of the entire room in full 3D. PR2 sensors stream this data through algorithmic software, which allows it to navigate its ever-changing environment. Ross and his fellow students are finding ways to harness these 3D sensors and rewrite PR2's algorithms to give it more natural interaction with humans, even respecting one's personal space. So the robot right now is trying to maintain a socially appropriate distance. Even when I move, the robot is trying to stay engaged in a social interaction. All of our robots are programmed to not get too close, ever. We don't have them touching people because touch is, you know, it can be unsafe. PR2 has a partner who is articulate and has a more personal way of relating to others. Hello, it's nice to see you. My name is Bandit, and we're going to play a few exercise games today. This is our humanoid robot platform. His name is Bandit. He's a socially assistive robot. He was designed to do daily physical exercise with the elderly. OK, great. You chose the imitation game. In this game, the robot is imitating my own movements. So I'm deciding what the robot and the exercise what to do. Having too much fun. So there he's giving me some brief comments and little feedback. Bandit analyzes the exerciser's movement in real time. What he can do now is he's got a camera at the base of, of the torso, and he's using the black background to easily segment out my body from the background. Bandit then imitates the exerciser's movements, creating a more intimate connection with each person it works with. Our robot Bandit has been used with stroke patients, with kids with autism, and with elderly users with Alzheimer's. Socially assistive units like PR2 and Bandit take robots one step closer to Asimov's childhood prophecy. In many ways, one can think of Asimov as the first roboticist. He thought about what robots could do for people in a way that we're just now starting to catch up with. 